Well, good morning and welcome to the first week of our brand new fall series. And that series is Jesus. For the next four weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to simply focus on the name above every name. And that name is none other than Jesus Christ. See, Jesus was the name that was chosen by God the Father himself for his only begotten Son. You know, names are very insightful, especially as you read through the Old Testament. You'll find that every single name has a meaning behind it. For example, Abigail means my father's joy. Or Anna, we know the name Anna from the Old Testament. It means favor. It means grace. Esther, we know about Queen Esther, means a star. S-T-A-R, a star. Or what about Eve, the very first woman? It simply means, and it's so insightful, the giver of life. And then as you look at Adam, Adam means man from the red earth. Or Caleb, he means faithful. He sure lived up to that, didn't he? Or David, he's called the beloved. And that's exactly what the name David means. Or Isaac, how many know what Isaac means? Isaac means laughter. She was 90 years old, heard she was pregnant, and she laughed. (laughs) I think my wife would cry. (laughs) John, very common name. John means the grace of God. And so Jesus was the name that was chosen by God the Father himself for his only begotten son. Now the angel's message both to Mary and to Joseph was emphatic. You are to name the child Jesus, not Joseph Jr., not someone else who comes out of the family line, but rather you are to name him Jesus. Now the angel's visitation, as we read in scripture, was first to uh, a wonderful lady by the name of Mary, Mary the Virgin. Here's what it reads, Luke chapter 1, starting verse 26. It says, now this is a portion of scripture, matter of fact, the two we're going to read back to back, about the naming of Jesus, these two are oft times neglected other than at Christmas time. And so we're reading them before Christmas, getting ready for Christmas, all right? And we're getting ready to see what the word of the Lord has to say about this name and how this name was to be given. It says in the sixth month Elizabeth, of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel, Gabriel, to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, the descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of a greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him altogether Jesus. That's right. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Now, in essence, this very same message then is going to be delivered to Joseph. I find it interesting that how God, he always speaks to both parties. And uh, I believe he does that in marriages as well. If he's speaking to your wife, I believe he'll confirm it to the husband. To the husband, confirm with the wife. God is always wanting to bring unity. And so he now sends the same almost identical message. is going to go to Joseph. And we read about that in Matthew chapter 1. Here's what it says. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Let's just take care of this quietly behind the scenes so we don't make a big roar in the city. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what, she, what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. 
She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name, once again, Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. This is the prophet Isaiah, and you can read about it in Isaiah chapter 7, and again in Isaiah chapter 9. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and gave him the name, once again, altogether, Jesus. That's right. Now, friends, it might be a surprise to you this morning to know that there are more than 700 different names and titles ascribed to Jesus throughout the Bible. For instance, you go back into Isaiah, you'll find that he is called the Wonderful Counselor. He is called the Prince of Peace, the Mighty God. If you go into the New Testament, you'll discover he is called the Good Shepherd. In the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, he is called the Alpha and the Omega, which means the beginning and the end. And you'll find that there are 700 different names that are ascribed to him and attributes ascribed to Jesus throughout the Bible. However, no name or designation is as descriptive as the name ascribed to him by God the Father. He said, you shall call his name Jesus. And again, it might surprise you to know that that name Jesus was a rather popular name throughout the first century in Judea. Matter of fact, if you go into any one of the communities at that time and shout out the name, Jesus, come here, you'd probably have 10 little boys come running. And so it was a common name. Yet, you're going to discover today how God called this a very special name and made it to be the name above all names. And so for this reason, the Lord is often called then Jesus of Nazareth. And the reason why he's called Jesus of Nazareth is so that you might distinguish him from all the others, and this was done identifying him with the city of Nazareth. Now, despite his commonness, his name is remarkably significant. The Bible tells us that Jesus was sent by his heavenly Father for a particular purpose, and his name declares his mission. You will discover here that in the Hebrew language, his name is Yoshia. Yoshia, which means, or translated, or even transliterated, becomes Joshua. So Joshua in the Old Testament is the same as Yoshia. But when translated from the Hebrew to the Greek, which is the original language of the New Testament, his name then becomes Jesus. Remember now, his name declares his mission. Listen to what it says once again in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Now here's the why. Notice it says, you are to give him the name Jesus because, or you might say, for this reason, he will save his people from their sin. So the name Jesus was to be ascribed to him, because his mission was wrapped up in his name, which simply means Savior. Jesus literally means Yeshua, or Jehovah is the God of salvation. So Jesus then, when he came, he brought help, he brought hope, and he brought deliverance from sin. And his name bears, when you say the name of Jesus, everyone in that day would have known. The name of Jesus means salvation is of God. And they were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for the day when God would send his only begotten son, just like was promised all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And then all throughout the Bible, you'll discover that the prophets are all saying, one is coming and he's going to be the savior of the world, the Messiah. And so Jesus then, when he came, he took the name that was given to him by his Father in heaven, and it literally means he is the one that is the Savior, he is the one that is a helper, and he is the one that is a deliverer. Jesus saves. He saves from the power of sin, from the guilt of sin, 
and from the penalty of sin. Friends, I'm so glad that the Bible tells us that once we come to Christ and once we've been forgiven and when Christ comes to live inside of us, it declares greater is he that is within us than he that is within the world. And as a result of that, we can know that the power of sin that once controlled us, the things we once did, the way we once lived our lives, that power of the evil one over the way we live our life is literally broken through the power of Jesus Christ. And I'm so glad that the Bible says, sin shall not have dominion over you. And I am glad this morning that when Christ comes into our lives and when Jesus comes to dwell inside of us, he breaks that power of sin over our lives. Not only does he break the power of sin, he breaks the power of guilt over our lives. You know, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament that they would bring bulls and rams and goats, they would offer them up as sacrifices, and in doing the right thing, they knew that God would accept their sacrifice. However, they would return back home after offering up sacrifice, and they would say, you know, I know that I should feel different, but I still feel the guilt of my sin. And when Christ came, when Jesus Christ came as the Savior of the world, when he saves, he not only breaks the power of sin, but he cleanses the mind and he takes away the guilt of the past. Friends, I am so glad that we can live without the guilt of the past and that we can know that Christ comes and dwells within us and he has now taken up his residency and he breaks the power of sin. He breaks the guilt, you know, over our lives, but he also has taken care of the penalty of sin. The Bible tells us that the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Aren't you glad for the freedom we have in Christ today? And aren't you glad that he is the one that took the penalty for us? It should have been each and every one of us that died on a cross. It should have been us dying for our sin. But God sent his only begotten son into this world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And friends, I'm so glad for the life that we can have and that has been provided for us through the name of Jesus. His name literally means salvation is of the Lord. I love the old song. We don't sing it much any longer, but it's a great old song. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. There's a line in there that goes this way. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Can you say amen to that today? That your life has been transformed. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. Yes, his blood has availed for me. In John chapter 8 and verse 36... Jesus was bantering back and forth with a number that were talking about sin and how sin would have control. And here's what Jesus said. He said in verse 36, so if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Friend, I want you to know when the Son sets you free, whatever the bondages have been, those bondages are broken. I love that verse that says, you know, that Christ in us is the hope of glory. But I also love how it says that, you know, that his strength and his power is resident inside of us. Greater is he that is within us than he that's within the world. Remember what it was like when the greater one was the power of the enemy on the outside and you did your best to overcome. When Christ comes to live inside of us, he breaks the power of sin, he sets us free, he takes away the guilt of sin, and he takes the penalty of sin and whomsoever the sun sets free is free indeed. You know, a doctor, and doctors, we're grateful for them. They may mend our bodies. A psychologist or a psychiatrist can help us cope with a loss that we're having a difficult time with. Dave Ramsey, if you know that name, Dave Ramsey can show you the way out of debt. He'll help you in that capacity. But friend, you need to know this morning and remember that only Jesus can save from sin. His name declares that he is the Savior. He is the Savior from the power of sin, the penalty of sin, and the very presence of sin. He's going to remove us from it all one day. 
Here's what it says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. I read this from the CEB, which is the common English version. It says, only Jesus has the power to save. His name is the only one in all the world that can save anyone. Friend, I'm so glad that salvation is found in the name and the person of Jesus Christ. David Wilkerson, many of you would probably know his name. He's the one that started Teen Challenge. And he's, you know, in our, in our time period in the last, you know, 30 years, he has probably been, you know, prior to his death, one of the greatest voices of God, one of the, I would say, true prophets of God. Whatever you would speak, you knew came from God. And David Wilkerson said this. He said, the name of Jesus is the most loved name, and at the very same time, time, the most hated name on planet Earth. To those of us that know Christ, and just as we were singing a few moments ago, that name of Jesus, there's something inside of us that loves that name, that identifies with that name, and wants to exalt that name and lift that name on high. But David Wilkerson said, not only is there a group that loved that name, there's a group that hates that name. You know, someone has written and said that armies, emperors, and kings have all marched against that name. They have vowed that they would erase it from the face of the earth and that they would eliminate the followers of this Galilean. One of those emperors was Julian the apostate in the third century, and uh, he was one of the last emperors of Rome. Julian said, I'm going to eliminate Christianity. He went on to say, I'm sick and tired of hearing the name of Jesus. And I am sick and tired of the influence of his followers and that how they exercise that in our midst. He said, I'm going to organize an army and go out and wipe them off the face of the earth. So Julian organized his army and went out to destroy Christianity. But one day on the battlefield, he was struck by an enemy's arrow that pierced through his heart, and that great emperor of Rome fell to the dust, wallowing and even choking in his own blood. As his commanders surrounded him, they asked him, Emperor Julian, Emperor Julian, what can we do to help you? And he cried out and screamed out in the loudest of voices that he could muster, Leave me alone. As he laid there dying in the dust of the battlefield, his last words Julian the Apostate ever pronounced were these, you have won Galilean. You know, it says in Luke chapter 1, verses 30 to 33, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants, that is Israel, and those descendants that followed after, which would be all of us gathered here as Christians today. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. And his kingdom will never end. Julian had set out to stop it. It set out to absolutely destroy Christianity. Christianity still abounds to this day. Julian has met his end. I want you to know his kingdom will never end. Let me say it again. His kingdom will never end. And when the enemy comes against it, his kingdom will never be overcome. His kingdom will never end. Friends, you need not worry about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God will never know demise and will never know defeat. Jesus was born contrary to the laws of nature. He lived in poverty, was reared in obscurity, and only once he ever crossed the borders of his teeny little land he was born in. He had no wealth or influence and had neither training nor education in the world's schools. His relatives were inconspicuous and far from influential. In infancy, he startled a king. In boyhood, he puzzled the learned doctors. In manhood, he ruled over the course of nature. He walked upon the billows and he hushed the sea to sleep. 
He healed the multitudes without medicine. He made no charge for his services. He never wrote a book, yet all the libraries of the country could not hold the books that had been written about him. He never wrote a song, and yet he furnished the theme for more songs than all of the songwriters combined. He never founded a college, yet all the schools together cannot boast of as many students as he has. He never practiced medicine, and yet he healed more broken hearts than all the doctors far near. Great men have come and gone, yet he lives on. He was rich, and for our sake he became poor. How poor? As Mary, as the wise men, he slept in another's manger. He rode on another man's donkey. He was buried in another man's tomb. The names of many past proud statesmen of Greece and Rome have come and gone, but the name of this man abounds more and more. Herod could not kill him. Satan could not seduce him. Death could not destroy him. The grave could not hold him. Jesus never fails. Hallelujah. Two weeks ago, I was blessed to be in London. And I mentioned to my wife as I was walking throughout the city, because everywhere that I went, I saw the insignia of Queen Elizabeth. It was inscribed literally everywhere on all federal buildings, it was on all bridges, on overpasses, it was on street corners, it was on street lamps, it was everywhere. And not even knowing at that time that she was ill, let alone at death's door, I said to my wife, I said, I wonder what's gonna happen when she passes away. For 70 years, they've been inscribing her name in anything and everything all across the entire country of Great Britain and all throughout Scotland and Wales and, you know, throughout even Canada. And I wonder what would happen at that moment. I, I asked her, I said, do you think they'll take and scratch her name out and then put Charles in? Do you think that's what they'll do? I have no idea. My point is, is that people can come and they can make as big a splash as they want their name can be inscribed on as many places as you can place it. But there comes a day, the Bible says, a point on a man wants to die, and then comes a judgment. Wonderful people, great people, and I put Queen Elizabeth in that category. From all outward appearances and from the writings and so on, it would appear she had a wonderful relationship with God. And she wanted her nation to walk with God and to know God. She was brokenhearted many times over her grandchildren, children, and the lives that they were living. But she's gone. Friend, I want you to know there's only one that lives on forever and ties together all of history, and that name is Jesus. And his name embodies his mission. I love how the Bible says, for God so loved the world, that means he loves you. That he means that he loves every nation on planet Earth. Those that existed when he walked the face of the Earth as well as all the new nations that have reshuffled since that time. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Friend, I want you to know Jesus, he saves. He saves from sin. He saves from bondages. He saves from depression. He saves from despair. Jesus, his very name declared to this earth what his mission was, to seek and to save the lost. Father, I pray today then the closing moments of this service, where the men and women would experience the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that they would, they would understand more than just the name, but they would embrace the meaning of the name, which means Savior. 
One thing to call out the name of Jesus, quite something else to identify in such a place and in such a role of He is my Lord, He is my Savior, He is my Deliverer, He is the one that has set me free. Father, I pray that in these next few moments, Lord, that you would do what you sent your Son into this world to accomplish, and that is to save to make a difference in the lives of men and women that are struggling. Lord, we're so glad where sin abounds, the grace of God doth much more abound. And I pray, Lord, for the one that would say, I don't know that I could ever be forgiven. Lord, I pray that they would come to understand that the word of God that we base our lives and our future upon declares that we're, where sin abounds, where sin was the worst, the grace of God was greater. And I pray, oh God, that these moments in the next few seconds here would be life-changing to men and women with heads bowed and eyes closed.